he told me that this is as good a system as anything. Well, one day it's Thursday, September 19, 2024. This is a week and charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. So what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, I'll have a lot to say about that. I know I say that every week, but this week I mean it. Your questions on trading, just type them in the chat, whether you're on YouTube or go to webinar. And I'll get to them as soon as possible, especially if they fit in with the uh, presentation. And if not, when we get to live charts, I'll make sure we get to all of them. We should have plenty of time tonight. Your favorite stock and crypto picks. We'll do crypto first, and then we'll do stocks. So what are we going to focus on? Methodology in action. I have a mystery chart for review. I want to do a 10% update. So I'm going to hold off on the million little things presentation this week because I got an email from somebody who had a lot of questions about trading the spies and cues, and we'll talk a lot about that. And then, of course, any questions, again, you may have, just punch them in. This is Claims Green. As you know, you can lose money trading. Laura's often summing up. Boring a line from Greg Morris. All predictions about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. There's all my contact info if you're watching on YouTube or the recording of this after 9.19. Just feel free to take a screenshot of that. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology and action. We have a reveal this week, and the chart is CLOV. That was a recommendation. By the way, you can find all these recommendations at davelander.com slash archives. So the buy was at three, stop was at two, IPT of four for a risk of one. It was a pullback. It was also a Landry light pullback. Notice that the big blue arrow is pointing higher. By the way, that seems kind of extreme, but that's what this particular stock called for. I forget the HV on it, but I think the 50 to HV was like 80 or so. And we can look at that when we get to the live charts. Anyway, you can see Landry light, which is illustrated below quite a few days of it. We had one little intersection here, but for the most part, you can see it's been in a pretty serious uptrend. And in addition to uptrend in the Landry light, which you have here where the lows are greater than the moving average, notice that this stock began to accelerate higher. So that makes for a really good setup. Nice clean chart. For the most part, it just goes up for the most part, day after day after day. And mathematically, that's equivalent to linear regression. I just like to draw a line through the bars and see how many I can intersect. But you can see it's very persistent in it, and in its acceleration higher, he tried to say. Anyway, pulls back to the 30 EMA, and that's illustrated down below. Notice the Landry light count goes from about 15 or so, 15 or 20, back down to zero, and that completes the, the setup. Now, I don't just trade Landry light pullbacks, obviously, and I just had this as a pullback. It's also a trend pivot pullback. You see this little pivot point here where try to rally came right back in. In fact, this almost triggered us in. It missed by one cent, and I thought it might have turned into a – wait for an entries example, but it did trigger. And so far, so good. We're not setting a world of fire just yet, but that doesn't poke in the eye. Entries here, stops down here again, and IPT is up here. So we'll see how it shakes out. Now, percentage-wise, I know that's huge. Again, I know that's what it calls for. All right, uh, no new mission charts this week. I actually don't have any setups going into tomorrow, and that's perfectly normal for the methodology. The database really hasn't been producing anything very exciting. Tonight, I'm kind of curious to see what stock picks you guys might have, and I'll be happy to flesh them out for you. But for now, I'm not really seeing a whole lot, and we'll get to some of that in just one second. All right, let's do a brief TFM 10% TFM update, especially with the market making new highs. Here are some zones, and these were inspired by Jeff, who's here tonight. Initially, I just had a line at 10% of the 50-week closing high, and then Jeff pointed out that he likes to get out when he's about 5%, when the market's about 5% away from that 50-week closing high. So he likes to get out a little bit on a little bit earlier. So I went ahead and created those zones. The top of that 5% zone would be 100%. I was helping a neighbor out. Let me just shut this phone off. I'm uh, my nickname, one of my friends calls me MacGyver. Anybody needs to fix anything, they come see me, which is kind of cool. I like that. Anyway, uh, the sell, just real quick, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about the system since we've covered it so many times, but uh, weekly close, 10% or more away from 50-week closing high, and a close below the 50-week moving average. There's my YouTube information. I have a lot of videos on YouTube. Check, um, Especially check the Traders Quick Clips. There's a lot of videos on TFM. Anyway, our last sell signal was here in the queues. 
it didn't quite trigger a sell signal. And we'll get to that in just one second. The buy is a little bit more stringent, bit of a whipsaw filter in there. Two bars of upside Landry light and within 10% of the 50 week closing high. And by the way, this is a weekly chart and we're buying and selling on a weekly chart on a calendar basis. And, and that's something that I didn't really put a lot of thought into when I first designed the system. But I want to leave the system as it is, as opposed to some people who change their systems to fit the markets. So I want to leave it with the original code or whatever you want to look at it. Anyway, so, so far so good. It's had a pretty good run, as you can see, since that last buy. And the stop would be a close below the 50-week moving average again and 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high. Now, based on today's high, you can see this zone jumped up a little bit. This is 100% of the 50-week closing high, which would be today's close. And you can see it jumped, the, the red zone jumped up too. And the moving average is catching up. Now, the moving average could easily get well above this 10% line. If that occurs, then a close 10% or more away. I'm sorry, a close below the moving average would not trigger a sell signal. It has to close below both. Anyway, so your sales about 5077 right now. Now, as a composite for S and G's, as I've said quite a bit, I thought I would just uh, take 100 shares, and again, the stop would be a close below the 50-week moving average and a close 10 percent or more away from the 50-week closing high, which would be right here, the top of this green zone. So this is minus 5 percent, this is minus 10 percent, and this is the 50-week again closing moving average, simple moving average for this. I use a simple moving average because this is a longer term trend following system. I wasn't as worried about it catching up the price as fast. In hindsight, the drawdowns are pretty steep. Maybe I, I could have thought about it at EMA, but you can see right here, it, because we're using a simple, was able to ride out this correction. Now this is pretty ugly. I'll show you this in just one second. It is something I didn't think about too much, but you can see based on this close, here which is earlier today so this is not the actual closing price but close to it i got in at 319.49 by the way and in older presentations that showed the actual trade i only did 100 shares it was kind of an sg type of trade but it's actually turned into real money now and based on this close the position's worth 16 to 17 thousand dollars now a little bit about a system before you trade anyone's system and by the way, I'm not a mechanical trader. I just did this uh, trading 100 shares just for fun. Um, I'm discretionary in my trading. I pick stocks. I'm a stock picker. And a swing to intermediate term is my time frame. I get in for a swing trade and hopefully hang on via trailing stops for a long, long time. And I'll touch upon that in just one second. But my designer's intent was to avoid the diaper change moments as Ian McActivy calls them, or used to call them, God rest his soul, great guy, by the way, to get you out of the way when things go south. Now, technical analysis 101 is if a market's going to drop 50%, it's going to drop 10% first, right? Okay. And not that it won't keep dropping after 10%, but 10% is a good round number for the indices, especially the S&P 500. And it works out pretty good in the queues. I did a brief analysis on the queues when uh, that I, I got that buy signal a while back and decided that it might be worth a shot for kind of like S and G's. One thing I didn't build into the system that I have built into my core methodology, and again, you can go to davelearn.com slash archives. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier, but you can see all of the setups for years and years and years that I recommended, warts and all. And uh, if you're wondering how to pick good stocks, not that I'm a great grand poobah, but if you look at the stocks that I picked, you'll notice that they should have persistency, acceleration, decent volume, but not super thick to where they're too efficient, something I'll touch upon in just one second. And quite a few other things, but as you go through them, and each day when I talk about the setup, if you can't sleep at night, then watch those, and you'll see, you'll learn a lot about stock picking for free. Now, I did a course on stock picking, be happy to sell it to you. It's 14 hours of just how to pick stocks, but you can get a lot of good information for free by going through those archives. Anyway, no, ma no money management is built into the actual system. In other words, I'm not taking profits. It's either all in or out. In this case, it's 100 shares. Like, ah, eh, who cares? Well, it started to add up. But so I care now. <laughs> so
So there are some unintended benefits, so to speak. Again, the designer's intent was to build something to get you out of the market when it looks questionable, but it also turned into a decent little trend following system. And I have one client that's that's been around the markets a lot longer than me. He was traded way back in the 70s, and I think he's recently retired, but he told me that this is as good a system as anything, and it's something that he he also follows and he likes. So that that was a big vote of confidence for me that this little simple system can work. And by the way, simpler is always better. That's why I trademarked trading simplified. You'll notice that on my website. Now it does act a lot, act, it does act a lot like a longer term trend following system. By the way, one thing I've noticed over the years is all methodologies that are similar methodologies tend to act in a certain way. So if you've got a longer term trend following system, your drawdown is going to be abysmal and your accuracy is going to suck, okay? <laughs> a shorter term system, you're going to be a lot more accurate, but if you're trading a pure short term system, and spoiler alert, I'll get to that in just one second, you're going to occasionally get whacked. And I'm of the strong belief that a pure short term swing tra trading system, in other words, you're going to get after so many days, does not work. But longer term, you're risking too much longer term, but that's where the money is. So I take a hybrid approach where I'm taking partial profits along the way. So it does act a lot like a longer term trend following system. It'll catch some fantastic trends, but it does have some pretty serious drawdowns. We'll take a look at that right now. So you can see again, I got long way back here. I forget, I've forgotten when, it was March of 2023. So I've been long for over a year, almost a year and a half. That's crazy. Anyway, you can see from that peak to trough, that was a $4,482 loss. Now remember, that's only on 100 shares. So that's a pretty substantial loss. And then right here, this was a $3,600 open loss. Now, because we didn't stop out, these are paper losses. But if your stop is hit, if it's a paper loss or not, it doesn't matter. You have to take your loss. And then the biggest one here, which was quite painful, was an $8,000 drawdown. And that one was kind of hard to stomach. Again, it, it started out kind of like an S&G type of trade. Who cares? 100 shares. But then it became real money, as you can see, over time. And what's amazing is this was like a 60% move, at least to the peak, from that entry. And that's in the NASDAQ queues. Now, that... Believe it or not, I'm going to sit here in, in a few minutes or stand here as I am standing now and talk about how indices such as the Qs and the Spiders and E-minis are, are wildly efficient, okay? But this market actually made a really nice inefficient move, about 60% over the last year and a half or so. So that's that's kind of cool. I know you're going to part it with me. But anyway... Part of longer term trend following is abysmal drawdowns. That's why we again scale out and then we trail that stop higher over time. Okay, just real quick for the Landry 100, I, I want to do proof of concept. And this is something that I talked about a little bit last week in San Francisco, last week at Bandcamp. I spoke at the TSAASF, which is a technical analysis society. And it's a great bunch of people. It's my third time speaking in 15 years. Linda Rasky was there. Uh, her husband, Damon Pavlatis, was there. Bollinger, uh, me, Bob Schott. So it was really a really good, uh, really good seminar. But one of the things I talked about, my topic was Livermore, because I did a big series of Livermore a couple of years back on stock charts. And then Bruce Frazier called me up, asked me to do, uh, to present in San Francisco on that. And I tied it, the the overall theme of the seminar was old school, new school. So I talked about a lot of things that Livermore talked about and how, even though it's many years ago that he discovered these things, they're still relevant, relevant today. And one of the things was a stock is never too high to buy. Now, again, I don't want to get into the whole seminar that part of it but there are some caveats you don't want to just rush out and buy new highs unless it's something like crypto and the market's blowing and going and as we'll get to in, in a few minutes it's very inefficient market but if you're buying a big basket of stocks you're much better off 
buying new highs, of course, and trying to bottom fish. Now, just real brief to those who weren't familiar with it, a few months back, I think it was the uh, end of May, beginning of June, the oldest one I had in here was May 30th, if I believe that I found so far. And you can see a couple of early June ones in here. The tracking date when they were put in is here, okay? And then this is the move since they've been put in. So this one here, to my surprise, is going 80%. I had one of them that I pulled off the list recently, ASTS, I think. And it was, it, I pulled it off at 180. I think it was closer to, uh, well over 200, closer to 300 before it started drawing down. But anyway, this is a hypothetical. Everything else I'm showing you is live trades, like the Q trade, like the CLOV. I have took 2,000 in my model account. I have other share sizes and other accounts, but I do keep a model account where I actually make the trades. So I can tell you where I got in, where I got out, what discretion I used, and so on and so forth. But anyway, it's pretty amazing that this was bought on a new closing high. Now notice that it immediately went into a bit of a drawdown, and that's why it would be tough to just rush out and buy new closing highs. However, if you were to spread it out over a bunch of stocks, eventually, and, and maybe not that eventually, maybe sooner rather than later, a lot of these will take off and make it all worthwhile. So this one had an 80% run since July 31st, when it first was placed in the portfolio and counting. And then if you look at some of these other ones, this one's nearly 60, 50, 40 something, 30 something, 30 something, 30 something, 30 something, all the way down to, these are the first, I think, 40 stocks in here. And most, all the stocks right now are winners in the list, but we had a nice little move after that spill we had in the overall market. So that helps. Okay, letters, we do get letters. So I'll read these one by one, but essentially this gentleman was asking about trading the spies and the cues, uh, specifically on an hourly time frame. Now, first and foremost, I don't hold myself out there as a day trader. I am a position trader, as I just said, a discretionary position trader, swing to intermediate term and hopefully much, much, much longer. Every now and then we'll hold stock for a couple of years. And uh, I think, Two or three years is a record since I've been doing this or holding the stock, but I'll hold the stock as long as it moves in my favor slash doesn't stop out, as long as it doesn't stop out. Because sometimes, obviously, it's going to back and fill quite a bit. So I don't want to hold myself out there as a day trader. I used to really preach against day trading, and to some extent, I still do, simply because we're not wired to make that many decisions. And I find my life gets a lot better when I'm not day trading as much. I have a, a doctor friend, now he day trades too, but it's a client and uh one day i told him i was like uh my, my back really hurts my upper back just kills me when i when i do a lot of day trading what do you recommend he goes stop day trading <laughs> but he's as guilty as i am he's actually worse so i don't want to come across as an expert but i do know a little bit about markets and some of the things that i can tell you other than don't do it uh will possibly help so before i got into Tonight's sort of working on tonight's presentation. I did this quick little post on Facebook, and we'll get into efficiency in one second. But keep in mind that indices are wildly efficient. Okay, there's a lot of noise in the market. There's a lot of people fighting it out. Okay, and then after last weekend, especially talking with Damon and all, who used to be a an S&P broker, trading thousands of contracts for a lot of these big kind of like a who's who in the hedge fund world would execute through him. So he knows a lot about the fun and games too. But early in my career in 96, I think, and I think that lasted almost 14 years, I was a consultant for a hedge fund doing technical analysis. And I learned a lot about how the, now this was bonds, but I learned a lot about how traders work and you've got really savvy traders trading bonds. And you also have some people that have to come in and they need to be long or short a certain amount and they'll just <clears throat> pile in without even caring about what it does to the market. And one thing that I was talking with Damon about over the weekend and some of these big traders, if they need a thousand contracts, big contracts of the S&P 500, they might quietly buy them up all day. Now this is many years ago when, the, when they still had the big contract, but they would quietly buy them up all day 
and that last three, it was, he would say, just keep it kind of cool, and they would just kind of slowly buy them up. And everybody does this. This is not this is not a um, industry secret or anything. But if you got to buy a thousand, you don't just say a thousand at the market, right? That would make the market go nuts. But what they do is they spread it around the pit, fifty here, fifty there, hundred here, hundred hundred there, and then the last three hundred they just buy in a panic, like, oh, I got to buy them, but we need it, we need it. But they just throw in all the hand signals, oh, you know, whatever they do, <laughs> three thousand, three. Look at how, how what three thousand is or something like that or whatever, and they buy them all at once, three hundred, and and that creates a panic, and all of a sudden the market's like, oh my god, this big hedge fund guy is he must be in a pickle, and he's he's trying to buy them all up, and so everybody rushes in. And then all of a sudden they feed the ducks while they're quacking, borrowing a term from Linda Rasky. So the point I'm trying to say is there's a lot of fun and games that that happens and they create this hysteria. Now it's it's legal market manipulation, I guess you could say, but it, it, it's manipulation or something nonetheless. They're just trying to, to do these things and to get the best fills and to help their positions along. Now, I found this slide from a while back, and I forget what year, maybe 19, maybe 1990, uh, up in the 1900s. <laughs> That's my dad for Gatesy, he talked about that. Um, but e minis are incredibly efficient. You're competing against the pea shooters all the way up to the major players, which includes some savvy and not so savvy players, at least that's how. It appears so. Let's say some big fund needs a hedge. Sometimes they might just step on the market, and without any, with a complete disregard, it could also be a, a a rounders. I don't know why I put rounders rounders market, but rounders market. I think there was a movie called Rounders. I think it was Matt Damon, and they was talking about how poker. A lot of the poker players are called rounders because it's like the money just goes around and around and around the table. And you never really get anywhere. Now, this is a, an older slide, but uh, some of the things for maybe an intraday strategy strategy might just be buy when they're going up, using stop entries and attempt to maybe hold the low of the day if you can. A lot of cases that would be kind of extreme, but if you're if you're playing like an opening gap reversal, then maybe the low plus a little wiggle run might be a place to get in. And then you could sell them while they're going down. Maybe use a stop entry and attempt to hold the high of the day now that's a very crude strategy i wouldn't recommend you just rush out and do that tomorrow but that's something you might want to kind of wrap your head around especially if you have some kind of backing on a daily chart or if it's a russian doll type of setup meaning that the daily charts are set up a certain way or if you're trading something like an opening gap reverse or whatever one thing i've noticed and this is something that was confirmed by talking with damon is sometimes you have this race to the finish either up or down and that could be like an order imbalance that's happening. So if a fund is, is uh, let's say an ETF fund is long and then it's also short, they also have a short fund, then they've got to balance out according to SEC and they might have to rush in and buy a couple of hundred contracts. Peter Brandt once said, don't lose 30 cents in a 10 cent market. And that kind of struck a chord with me, especially years ago when I chased my tail a lot uh, trying this e mini thing, right? And what he's saying is if the market's just kind of bumping along up and down, up and down, up and down, don't go in there and, and make a bunch of trades and lose a bunch of money. Wait for it to go one way or the other. Now, one thing I, I do, and sometimes I get a little caught up in the markets and not pay attention, but one thing I try to do is you want to wait for that range to begin to expand a little bit. And I, this is a, a think or swim formula, pretty simple formula. I'm looking at the today's day, the high minus the low, and based on the 10 day ATR. Now, as I'm looking at this, and this is the beauty of teaching, is that that's yesterday's ATR, average true range. Maybe I should change this formula to be the average intraday range because the high and the low would be your intraday range right okay anyway you divide those two out and as a general statement you want to stay out of the market if it's 50 percent or below if it's below 50 percent of its average range as a general statement if you're playing opening gap reversal or something you don't have the day's range so you don't know or some of the day's range um, another thing is is let's say the range is over 50 percent and you have a big 
rush down during the day and all of a sudden there's a vacuum and go straight back up. Sometimes you can play that fake out of the fake out. But this little formula will keep you out of a lot of trouble because if the market's just kind of chopping around, like Peter Brandt said, it's a 10 cent market. You know, you don't want to go in and lose 30 cents. And you might want to give up after a couple of three stabs at the market. Now, to understand efficiency, inefficient markets versus efficient markets, an inefficient market would be like an IPO, thinner stocks within reason, lower price stocks sometimes, like that CLOV. That looks like a pretty inefficient stock to me. ULS was an IPO recently. We recently played and got stopped out of that one. Uh, NNE went to the freaking moon and unfortunately came right back in. That's an inefficient stock because those huge moves aren't priced in. Now, higher HV stocks within reason. Now, you don't want to go too crazy, but higher HV with a little structure might be something that you might want to take a look at. Uh, shit coins can be hugely inefficient. We'll talk about those too. And, and keep in mind that as a market matures, it becomes more and more efficient. So Bitcoin, it's kind of going through that maturing process. Think about it. So now you've got derivatives, you've got ETFs, you got options on the ETFs, you've got futures, you've got options on those futures, you've got ETFs on those futures. <clears throat> so it's getting quite um it's getting quite crowded in the um in the in Bitcoin. Now an efficient market would be something like Forex or sorry about that. Forex or e minis as mentioned earlier, and uh, really big cap stocks. Now, I find it interesting when I go to the gym, and I've met a couple of guys there that are traders, or are learning to trade, I should say. Well, one in particular, young kid, and he's now off at, um, he went off to college, but he was trading E-minis, and he was going through a prop firm, so he was leveraged and trying to trade E-minis. That's a, that's a horrible way to, 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 <laughs> to learn how to trade. The other gentleman, is trading and still trades Forex and E-minis. And as I remind him quite often, those are the two probably most difficult markets that are in the world of trade. And then big cap stocks can also be wildly inefficient. Um, some of these big cap stocks might have, uh, I forget the actual exact numbers on specific stocks, but it's something ridiculous like hundreds, if not thousands of analysts looking at these stocks. So that could certainly cause a lot of of noise and canceling each other out and so forth and so on and so forth now with an inefficient market your your big moves aren't priced in and that's the whole idea and i'll show you a couple of inefficient moves here in just one second and that that cues now again a, a efficient market can make an inefficient move like the cues it's just something that doesn't happen as often as it does in an inefficient market now, these imbalances can happen quickly. So the, the NNE, it's a mobile nuclear stock. And boy, that was the rage there for about a week. huh? <laughs> so everybody just rushed in and the thing went up, uh, something ridiculous. Unfortunately, it's one of those psh, bottle rocket moves that I often talk about. Now, keep in mind that it's a crowded playing field with many people fighting it out. And an efficient market, okay? You got people that are hedgers, and, and some of these people just come in and step on the market without even knowing they're doing it. Uh, others are a little bit more savvy, but they ended up kind of playing games. Fund managers, obviously. You could have an EP, ETF imbalance, which is something I kind of alluded to a second ago. And you you have one lotters, okay? So you a one lotter is not going to make that big of a difference, but if you have thousands and thousands of one lotters, it can. An inefficient market is a less crowded playing field. You have fewer players, obviously. Now, they can offer the best opportunities, especially if you're taking e position trades, as we do. Now, again, as I alluded to, inefficient moves can occur, but they can be infrequent and only during special circumstances. So maybe you might have a big gap down in a strong uptrend, and that creates a vacuum, and the market goes straight back up in an efficient market. 
Open gap reversals, that, that's, I just described an open gap reversal or ogres as we now call them. Now on the short side, I actually kind of like a more efficient market because an inefficient market, let's say I short some kind of biotech and tomorrow they announce I've got some cure for some horrid disease or whatever, that biotech might double overnight and I'm gonna be a hurt and pup short in that, being short, right? Whereas if you have a, a big cap stock that has a lot of players in it and it begins to roll over, then there's a possibility that more and more of those players are going to rush to the door as that move begins to accelerate lower and you're short. Now, shorting is a tough thing. We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, we could revisit that when we have to, I guess, when market begins to roll over again. But shorting could be really, really tough. Anyway, so this is a, um, I dusted off my, crypto account and I saw this one going up. Now, again, I recommend you don't buy stocks just going up. I like setups like the ledger light pullbacks and bow ties if it's markets making a transition rolling over. APH is one we played not too long ago on the short side and it turned out to be a better than the poke in the eye trade. I did trade options on that and it turned out pretty good, pretty well. Um, and you can go and watch the YouTube on that. It's a week of charts from probably a month ago maybe a little longer. But anyway, I just want to show you a live trade here. So I bought this one a couple days ago. And my IPT initial profit target is up here at 20%. Now here's one we talked about in the week of charts about a month or two months ago, maybe a little longer. And I wanted to show this in the seminar I was part of because it's it's such a wildly inefficient move and money management was crucial. And the other reason I wanted to show it was that this was a new shit coin and it was just going up. And so I bought it because it was going up. Now, again, unless you're like in a 1999, you don't want to rush out and bunch of, buy a bunch of stocks just as they're going up. But these shit coins can become all coins as some people call them, the non-trader types, uh, can make some wildly inefficient moves. So you can see that was a 675% run and uh, took partial profits at 20% higher. I did scale out a tiny bit of this one. I did some um, mining. So I did some mining, so to speak, and took off uh, small amounts of this and put it into Bitcoin. And that's kind of like uh, something I've been doing for S and Gs over the years is kind of mining these altcoins as opposed to trying to run a minor uh, computer, which, I don't think an individual person could make money doing that. Correct me if I'm wrong, or if you're doing it and you can make money doing it, let me know. But to me, it just seems like a, a horrible way to try to make money, at least in this day and age, unless you're like a, a Mara or one of these big companies like Riot and a few others. But anyway, I stopped out for 420% gain, better than the poke in the eye. And keep in mind with this altcoin stuff, I'm doing the nickels and dimes. I'm not, I'm not, this is not my core methodology. This is not my bread and butter, but it is a fun thing to do because trading is trading for the most part, and especially in these wildly inefficient markets. Now, one thing I pointed out again in last week at Bandcamp in the seminar is that this thing did a round trip. So, money management obviously is crucial. You're like, Dave, you sure to give up a lot in a trade. Yeah, but I already took some partial profits off and I scaled out a little bit, like I just said, mining, so to speak, to Bitcoin. And then I stopped out after giving up a substantial part of the trend. But I didn't know whether that, I didn't know, you never know if the last correction is going to be uh, just a correction, right? So you have to give it lots of room once you're in that longer term trend following mode and see how long you can hang on. All right, let's uh, pick, let's pick the question apart a little bit. So for the initial profit target of trailing stops, and he's talking about Qs and the spiders, and I would apply this to other ETFs too. Uh, by the way, cert certain ETFs can be a little trendy at times. I, JNUG, which is kind of um, shocking to me, can actually, when it trends, it can really trend. Now, it might whipsaw a lot here and there, but every now and then, you can catch a pretty good trend in something like JNUG. But anyway, for initial profit targeted trailing stops, would the methodology still call to have an IPT at half for half the position and let the market take you out the second half? Yes, okay. So even though I'm trading intraday, my goal is to do some intraday trend trading. I probably need to sit on my hands a lot more. I'm really good at it, and then I give up all the money, and then I'm really good at it again. So anyway, um, 
So no, we're not we're not trying to get in, hold the full position. What I'm trying to do or trying to accomplish is get in, take partial profits, and have that stop move to break even. By the way, he kind of alluded to holding positions overnight. Do not trade for short term. Do not trade short term any market. Let me, I need to work on my English on that. But <laughs> what I'm saying is a pure short term trading system simply doesn't work. Okay. And I was really into early in my career thinking that I could figure out a way to trade for short term. If you're trading and holding positions overnight, you're going to get whacked sooner or later. That's one of the few things I can guarantee in this business. However, if you're holding, willing to hold longer term, you're also going to capture some amazing gains, like that 420% gain earlier in that uh, shitcoin, TIA, or maybe a couple hundred percent gain in a, in a stock over a year or so is possible. And if you do get whacked, and you will get whacked on occasion, at least you make enough money to pay for that spanking that you got overnight. And remember, something bad can happen overnight. And today was a perfect example. I came in, a futures are down 90-something points. So at 90 points, that's a $4,500 $4, loss just on one contract for the E-mini. So that's kind of crazy. So yeah, if you're interested in trading, you want to take partial profits and trail the stop higher. Just like position trading, the IPT, initial profit target, is going to equal your entry plus your stop distance. So you're trading, and this might be a little tight, but let's say you're trading something like Lab D and using a 10 cent initial profit target, I'm sorry, a 10 cent protective stop, well, then you could set a an IPT for 10 cents, okay? Every now and then, I try to finagle the system a little bit, and I don't actually have a system, so it's just, that's kind of metaphorically speaking, but I might try to use a little bit tighter stop and a little bit wider initial profit target, but that, that has problems in and of itself because the noise statistically is more likely to stop me up than hit that initial profit target, but as a general rule, Give them enough room to where they can, they have enough room to trend, and then you have that initial profit target in there, which is again, it's the entry plus the stop distance. And yes, ideally, you want the market to be trending longer term in your favor, so you want to have the wind in your sails, so to speak, unless you're you're looking at a major reversal from an oversold situation where the VIX is ridiculously high or any other metric you're using to help you time the market is there. So the bottom line is, you know, after I put out, put together all this, I'm getting ready to go live. I'm thinking the bottom line is I'd like to talk you out <laughs> of intraday indice index trading. Now for position size, he's am I looking at the daily risk, the daily volatility? Well, I mean, that's in the back of your head, right? And are we managing the volatility based on the hourly charts? Well, it all depends because sometimes the volatility and he's he's on to something here. The volatility can expand quite a bit on an intraday chart. Like I just said, 10 cents on something like Lab D. Well, there might be days like today where, where 10 cents is just kind of noise on that one alone, and you could stop that noise alone. But many other days, that's enough room. Something like the Sox S, I guess, maybe a half a point. I'm trying to think of some of the stop sizes I'm currently using in these markets. And I'll be happy to give them to you as I, if, if there's a particular market. Now, in the core methodology, we're risking 2%. And that's if stopped out. It's not a 2% stop. Not We don't get in and put a stop 2% below the market because I can all but guarantee that I'll get hit. What we're doing is we're risking 2% of the entire account. So in, in, in the 100K model, 2% would be $2,000. So... If you're going to day trade, I would keep the risk very, 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 very small because it adds up fast. If you lose $100 a day day trading, that's $25,000 a year. If you lose $1,000 a day, 
then that's $250,000 a year. So even if you had a sizable account and you're only trading 1% of that account, okay, $1,000 a day, you have a string of bad days, which can happen. It adds up really, really, really fast, okay? So again, his for max risk, does it take 1% or more, 2 to 3% since ETFs don't move as much? No, I would risk a, a, a minuscule amount. I would trade at such a small size to where it almost seems meaningless if you're going to do this type of trading. Now, stop placement is based on the pattern. So if you're trading an opening gap reversal, then maybe the opening range, below the opening range, the low of the day, plus a little wiggle room might be a good place for a stop. Now, triggering an entry, besides the bow tie being aligned, is another trigger such as 50 simple moving average, SMA use, or does the methodology use a 230 EMA? Again, I don't really have a defined methodology for day trading or intraday trading, as I like to call it. Um, I like to look at the 30 minute charts. And the reason I got to 30 minute charts, as I've said a thousand times, was I was looking at a five minute chart once and I, for e minis, and I found myself chasing my tail quite a bit becoming the definition of insanity, win a little, lose a little, win a little, lose a lot, lose a lot, win a lot, win a little, lose a little, you know, in and out, in and out, in and out. And by accident, I changed my charts to 15 minutes and I went like three days without a trade. I'm like, what the hell's going on? Something's wrong. Third day I made money. I think the fourth or fifth day I made money again. And then I realized that I was, I was seeing the forest more, so to speak, than the trees and not as caught, not as caught up in the noise. Now he keeps mentioning hourly charts. I actually use a 30 minute chart for what it's worth. Now, sometimes you just might want exposure, okay? There are days when I'm long a few stocks and I'm not trying to hedge, okay? Don't get me wrong, but I'll look at the market and the market all of a sudden begins to tank and I might put on some futures contracts just because it's the market's tanking. That gives me some initial exposure to the short side, then I can kind of figure out where I want to go from there. Those S&P contracts or the e minis are incredibly choppy and volatile and efficient. And it's, it's, uh, it's hard for me as a trend follower because I want to just hold on to them all day. In a lot of cases, I probably should be taking the gift horse of the, of the quick profits as opposed to hanging on. So it's it's a very complicated market to trade. Again, I'm trying to talk you out of trading intraday, especially in the S&P 500 and the Qs or other indices when it comes to intraday moves, right? Because they're choppy. Now, there's cases where you might want to trade a breakout after a fake out. I think I mentioned this earlier. Let's say the market breaks down, it looks like it's headed straight down and all of a sudden it begins to rally then it goes takes off so it shook out a lot of people takes right back off or like a false breakout comes in hard that second entry above that that fake out move the old saying the early bird gets the worm but the second mouse gets the cheese the second mouse type of signal might be something you want to think about um if you're trading especially if you're trading an individual issue but this does work with ETFs and I would recommend you look at the daily ETFs and one thing I've been kind of noodling with lately and sometimes you don't know to hindsight obviously but I like to look at lab U and lab D obviously Sox L Sox S and what are the other ones J Nugget J Dust and Gush and Drip and uh, I seem to look, I tend to look at the semis more than anything, but those are the four main ones. And when I look at these all on one screen, I ask myself, what's the play of the day, if any? If one of them is really, really moving, it has a bigger range than the rest, that's the one that I might want to be in. If you're in a fantastic market, you might just want to be thinking about being the stronger pairs um the up or down whatever the case may be and i do keep one quote window up uh, a watch list up i should say in one of the windows where i'm just looking at the strongest ones of the day 
And that plus looking at the four major ones to figure out what's the play of the day, which one should I be in. And that's where the real money is. It's like if I if I went back and looked at my trades, sometimes like socks and sometimes like J-Nug, like I love J-Nug when it trends. It doesn't always trend, but like J-Nug, which, which is odd because it's gold stocks and gold stocks to the shop around because they're commodity related, right? But something like J-Nug, something like Soxel, and even just a small position size, I'm shocked when you catch a really big move in those, it can really add up, even at a small position size. So that's another thing to kind of kind of think about there. All right, Jeff says indices are good for using options. Yeah, I, I do I do noodle around with zero DTE options, and I need to track it a lot better than I do. I don't make a lot of money in zero DT options. It's probably, it seems like it, it, it seems like a scratch, but every now and then I'll do pretty good. And with a zero DT option, something like XSP, they're often really too expensive to buy. But every now and then, if you're looking at the chart and you're saying, okay, this market looks like it's headed higher, it could easily go one or two strikes past this particular strike. So I might, I might go ahead and, and, and take a little stab at that. The beauty of something like XSP, it's kind of a white elephant. Uh, I, I know it kind of sucks you in because it's there's a, it's like candy, right? But you're looking at it like, oh, it's fifteen, you know, it's fifteen dollars a contract, fifteen cents, which is fifteen dollars. So it's like, ah, you know, let's 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 buy a few of those or whatever the case may be, and I'm only risking X amount or whatever. And then what I'll do is I'll instantly flip out half of those for a double. And sometimes it, it isn't that often. I don't want to make it sound like it's that easy. I'm just throwing out some ideas if this is what you want to do. And I'm working on it. But one of the things is, especially like with the, with the zero DTE XSP options, is every now and then a market's really looks like it's getting ready to take off or getting ready to move. And those out of the money options might be two or three cents, maybe three cents. And you could pick up 20 of them or something, or just a, however, you, however many you want, obviously, whatever you're, you're comfortable risking, especially if a market is already moving and you're kind of from a position of strength and you're not just throwing money out there for to throw money out there and put in like an order immediately to flip out half of those at a double. And many times I've established free positions doing that. The problem is a lot of days these things are too expensive to trade. It's kind of a feel thing. I'm still working through that. I don't have all the answers. If I did, I'd let you know. Everything I do, by the way, I, I fully disclose as far as like the position trading, the day trade, not, but uh, but the intraday trading is something that I'm working on. And that's a lot harder uh, to to teach and to do. And a lot of times I just tell myself, what the hell are you doing by doing these things? It's like you're, you're kind of glued to a screen. you got the tickeritis and all. So, again, I'm stuck here. And so I, I do watch the markets a lot. So I do find myself doing these trades and I have to be careful not to. And again, like I said earlier, watch the range and stuff. Okay, so indices are good for using options, small spread, and you don't get much slippage and you can have lots of volume so you don't get stuck in a trade. If you're selling time decay, works for you. Uh, I would, yeah, I'd be careful selling options. That's that's a that's a way to have a, a very brief, but a brilliant career or brilliant for brief career might be the better way of saying that. So be really, really careful if you do that. And yeah, the the I have a, what I call, and it's something, again, I haven't fleshed out other than by feel, but part of the race to the finish thing I mentioned earlier is I look at, uh, I'm in central time, so I look at, I have a little alarm goes off at 2.40 every day, which is 20 minutes before the close. I look at those E-mini options about 10 points or so out of the money because that's like a flash in the wind with an E-mini, a fart in a window unit, you know? it's like that you can move that far and sometimes those things are really 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 cheap the problem is as jeff's saying here is xsp options are ca are cash settled so you don't get stuck with the shares i've been i've been had i've had e-minis put to me and like oh crap i don't want all these e-minis you know because you can really get into a lot of trouble really fast so that's a little harder to manage but yeah the beauty of those xsp options and again, they seem to be expensive for the most part and not worth it because somebody who knows options probably like, Dave, you traded that, you're crazy. But every now and then they seem like they're worth it. And I lost money trading them today, but I did, I, I probably would have done okay if I wouldn't have gotten greedy, said no trader ever, right? 
by buying some puts late in the day when it looked like the market was kind of rolling over and then immediately put an order to sell half. So I immediately established a free position. So yeah, XSP options, zero DTE, XSP, difficult to trade. But the beauty is I just put them on and ride them to the close. And, and sometimes, and again, I'm not recommending you do this, but sometimes within the last minute of trading, the last five minutes of trading, I'll put on some S&G options in the, in the XSP and you would never do that in a million years in like an E-mini option or something. Well, if you could, you can't do a zero, zero, zero DTE, but let's say you could um, anywhere else. You don't want to be buying options that late in the day and get stuck with the shares. And there we are, zero DT options when they aren't too expensive and the market is trending or reversing. Sometimes it's kind of like a trader's feel. You could see the market beginning to turn and you're looking at those options. And you're like, well, those options look like they're pretty damn cheap. I think I might go ahead and pick up some for, and this is mostly S and G type trading. Occasionally I'll do a ratio spread, but that gets kind of tricky and I hadn't figured that out just yet. And one thing in trading is you really need to stick to your wheelhouse. Stick to your wheelhouse. So this is kind of like a side project I've been working on for a few years here. The bread and butter and the main thing I do and recommend you do too is the position trading where you're, you're hanging on to positions as long as possible and when we get if we get into a nice rip roaring bull market you'll have these positions that are making so much money you don't want to mess with all this other stuff or you don't need to for trailing stop this is a methodology continue to use a hard stop now i don't have a specific methodology again for day trading some of, I, I can show you little things i do like ogres and such but i don't have a specific methodology per se so what I do is one thing I like is I like automated trailing stops. Now I, I got I took a lot of trouble using these in Forex years ago because Forex tends to be a lot more spiky, super efficient, right? But a lot more spiky. It would spike up and my stop would spike up and I get stopped out and then I watch the market take off without me. That's another story. For the most part, I do really like these automated trailing stops. And then I set an order at the initial profit target. So that's how I play that. Okay. Anything, any questions on that? I know I wasn't too good of a salesman on this. I just want to throw out some ideas. And I would I would recommend you learn how to swing to intermediate term trade, okay? Hold a bit, but make sure you're holding a piece longer term to make it all worthwhile. I'd recommend you do that first before venturing into the intraday stuff. All right, I'm going to shift gears here. So here's this Osmo and... I'm not a breakout trader, okay? But in these altcoins, when they're really moving, sometimes you can just buy the strongest one. So 58 is going to be my IPT. I have a limit order already in place on that one. But if you sort these again by the strength, the strongest ones, and provided they have enough volume, sometimes you can just come in here and buy the strongest ones. Like that looks kind of interesting to me right now. Um, let's see. Yeah, that one's kind of, that, see, that was kind of breaking out. That looks pretty cool. And sometimes you could just, again, you could just buy these things as they're going up. And looks like the, looks like the old coins are waking up again. The shit coins. <laughs> By the way, as I preach each week, you never want to buy, as a general rule, you never want to buy a market that's below. And this is a great example here the 30 EMA, look at this. So almost as a, this entire trend, a 60 or 70% loss in this market, it was below the 30 EMA. So again, sometimes you can play the relative strength game and just buy the strongest ones. And then of course, use an initial profit target and trail your stops higher. All right, let's take a look at uh, the big boys. And if you guys want me to look at any pairs here, I'd be happy to do it, if not, We'll take a look at uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then we'll move on. So a lot of overhead supply to deal with in Bitcoin. And you can see Bitcoin's really been pretty noisy. It's like, um, go back to, when is this? Um, go back to the beginning of the year, go back to February. Where's Bitcoin? Uh, 62,000 or whatever. Where's it now? 62,000. So it didn't do anything, right? But if we could get through all of this fluff and go on to make new highs, that would be great. Again, I think the, the market is becoming more efficient. It's becoming noisier. And the other thing, too, without going into a lot of details, is I think that we're creating a lot of paper Bitcoin out there. Does the exchange 
is an exchange really placed in a trade or are they bucketing your orders back like the bucket shops used to do years ago? And a few of them, more than a few of them have been busted doing that. So a lot of, a lot of um, nefarious type of activity happening. There's Ethereum versus Bitcoin. And there's a trend. So if you want to own one or the other, you definitely want to be in Bitcoin based on this chart, right? Again, don't buy a market as long as it's below what the 50, I'm sorry, the 30 EMA. I'm beginning to like the 30 EMA more and more and more. And this is a, this is Landry light all the way down. That's for a long, 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 we long, long time. We'd never touch that 30 EMA. If you're new to trading, uh, I recommend you use no indicators, but if you were to use an indicator, use a 30 EMA and pay careful attention to the Landry light. If it's bouncing back and forth, Landry light count is low, then you might not have a trade or a trend, I should say. But if that Landry light has been either downside Landry light negative count or a positive count, meaning that the market's above the moving average, then you might just have a trend. All right, let's shift gears. I'm going to hop into stocks. And if there's any questions on anything, just feel free to type them in. My YouTube brethren, a little quiet tonight. Hello to you guys. Yeah, good points, uh, Jeff. Thanks for bringing those up. There's your Landry 100, just FYI. There are some losers in here. This one's a this is a, a glitch. I don't know why it's, this one's not down 80%. But you can see there's some losers, but right now they're pretty small. Uh, 1%, 2%, 0%. So Decent day for the list. A couple of big moves in here, seven percent moves. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. And again, uh, punch in your stocks if you want me to take a look at anything. Okay, what's the difference between the Bitcoin chart you show and the futures slash BTC? Okay, the the market I just showed was the cash market. Okay. So that's a cash Bitcoin that's buying and selling by individuals. A futures would be a leveraged contract with an expiration date. Okay. Just like gold is the physical metal, if you're trading the spot market, and if you're trading the futures contract, it's a contract that's a derivative of the underlying, which of course would be gold. So the point I'm often making, I make it almost every week, is all the gold in the world will fit into Olympic size swimming pool. But there's a lot more gold money-wise being traded around the world. So there's a lot of paper gold out there. All the derivatives, options, all this other good stuff. And that's kind of where the Bitcoin market is going now as it matures. It seems like it's it's uh, getting more and more of that happening. Just like the GBTC, for instance, GBTC, this is a stock that's supposed to represent the cash. So this is another derivative, and they should own x amount of bitcoins whatever that number is i think that's what it was kind of like be careful what you wish for they wanted an etf and then of course the the black rocks of the world pile in and this one I, it still has a tremendous amount of volume but some of these other ones uh, sort of uh cannibalized their their little um corner they had in the market there anyway let's talk about the p's s p 500 obviously Decent day today. We broke out to all-time highs. I'm not going to argue with that. My problem is if we come right back in. And in the gym today, I'm, I'm as I often say, I'm a man on the street kind of guy. And two of the guys in there uh, were talking markets with me, and they both were looking to get out of break break even. And I said, no, if we break out and we stay broken out, maybe trail will stop higher, but do not do not rush to get out. And that's why you have like double tops in that classical technical analysis because people are looking to get out at break even. And, and then in the last week at Bandcamp, Livermore goes through a lengthy explanation about how markets stall out and roll over and such. Well, before even reading that, I came up with like the bow tie and the first thrusts and patterns like that. And that's because when the market sells off hard, it begins to rally. People, they don't sell, most people don't sell when it does this. They're looking to get off the hook at break even. And if it gets about halfway there, it begins to roll over. 
sometimes that's a good time to trade. Sometimes if it just rallies up a little bit, it begins to roll over. That's an even better point, uh, point to, to short. But anyway, off the best level, it's still up almost one and three quarters percent. Nonetheless, I'm not going to argue with that. Bow ties are working their way back. They're almost to uptrend proper order again. Let's see. The 1075 is greater than not quite. So we're not quite an uptrend proper order, but we'll get there soon. NASDAQ composite, not a bad day there. The good thing is. We're pushing past this little peak in here that I've been watching carefully. And that's um, that's some resistance here. So we did get through that today. If we come right back in, that would be no bueno. So I think we're at a bit of an inflection point. If I get hit by a beer truck, make sure you pay attention. If the S&P 500 comes back in below its breakout level to where it was recently, then that would be that would not be a good thing if obviously the Nasdaq comes back in and gets below its retrace rally. Yeah, we'll get to that, Brian. Anyway, uh, IWM not a bad day there, but it's wide and loose and all over the place, so it's hard to get excited about the Russell at this juncture. I wouldn't get excited about the Rusty in, until it went on to make all-time highs, but it certainly had a decent day today. Gold, the commodity. Okay, day close at all time high, so that's a good thing. Gold stocks, though, yeah, they closed higher, but they're kind of wide and loose. They have a bit of a, a, a three drives to a high look to them. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan. I'm not a huge fan of that pattern, but it does, it does tend to occur. And gold looks like it doesn't. The gold stocks, it is, doesn't look like they have as much momentum as gold as the underlying commodity. So we we'll have to see how that shakes out. Let's take a look at some other areas. And you know what I was telling my clients earlier tonight is that it doesn't feel like a huge bull move when you look to the sectors, okay? And maybe because a lot of these sectors shot up yesterday and they're just retracing the amount they shot up. Kind of like the banks, you know, the banks are gonna bump against these old highs, so that's a little bit of concern. Now the mags did break out past the this retrace. Okay, you have a bit of a witch's hat pattern here to the downside. It looks like an inverted witch's hat. Okay, the witch hat. But now we broke out above it. However, if we come right back in, that would not be a good thing. It'd be no no bueno, right? Now take a look at major drugs. Kind of ended in Flatsville here. They tried to rally out of a pullback. And then they sort of end into Flatsville. So this is a little concerning. Uh, obviously, still in a decent trend. If we take out this little pivot high, it's a trend pivot pullback. That would be great. But I'd like to see that happen. Semiconductors haven't gotten quite back to their retrace. So again, if I get hit by a beer truck, keep an eye on this retrace here. Keep an eye on the old highs in the, in the NASDAQ. And to keep an eye, again, on the recent highs and the P's, we come... Let's say we take out yesterday's low, that would not be a good thing. I know I'm Captain Obvious there, but pay attention. Home Builders had a decent day. Look at that, close at all-time highs. So I'm not gonna argue with that. If they can continue to follow through, maybe on pullbacks, we'll see some setups. Telecom broke out to new highs off its best levels, but still close at brand new highs. Nonetheless, energies have been at a really choppy downtrend. I'd avoid the energies for now. Now, financials are bumping up against their old highs. They're rallying so far out of a pullback. So far, so good. However, I sure would like to see brand new highs, and I sure would like to see them stay there for a while. So that's pretty much it The market, with the market. The point I'm, I'm hopefully making is that it's still kind of mixed out there, even though a lot of areas have improved as of late. So just be really careful right now. And here's the thing. I let the database tell me what to do. And right now, it's not producing a lot of setup. So check back often. Okay, uh, Brian wants to know about shorting AMD. No, it's no longer really a pattern I would I would short. With these big, thick stocks like this, I like to catch them coming off their all-time highs. And again, as I mentioned earlier, APH was an example I used for the seminar. And you can see that we had a bow tie. It also had made all-time highs, big thrust lower. And then the entry was here and it went straight against us the next day. That was a bit of a bummer. Seems like all shorts go against you. It imploded nicely, but unfortunately did not follow through. 
So I wouldn't rush out and short AMD at this juncture. I would find something. We had one on Landry list tonight. I forget which one it is, but uh, it, it's a short, and I'm not going to recommend taking it just because it, it had a few issues. A lot of these stocks, and this isn't a great example, but a lot of these of these stocks on the short side do have a lot of support below. So your your gains would be limited. And also, while the market's trying to find its way higher, at the moment, I wouldn't rush out and short anything. Brian says his thesis is the SMH may be printing a shooting star, but we have to see how tomorrow, SMH. Yeah, you know, I, I don't get to, somebody was asking me over the weekend, again, last week at Van Camp, why I don't use candles. And I do have candle charts on my screens over here so I could see them from across the office. And that's the only reason I started using candles and two things happened. One, it's always a pattern. It's a, it's a shooting star. It's a, it's a baby with a poopy diaper. It's three birds crapping on a wire. It's a sumo wrestler fighting a pregnant woman, or it's always something, right? It's not always a pattern. Okay. Yeah. There's probably some kind of like right here, this is probably like a bearish engulfing at all-time highs. Yeah, that's a good thing. Okay, that's a bearish pattern. I'll give you that, uh, especially since it's kind of a minor double top. Yeah, I'll give you that. But if you're in a big choppy range and you're looking at all these little patterns, like a shooting star or whatever else they call them, then I, I wouldn't read too much into them. But yeah, it could stall out. It could stall short of this prior peak and roll back over. That could certainly happen. Anything can happen, obviously. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't call a top in this market based on a, a one-bar candle pattern or something. Okay, let me check in with YouTube. You guys okay over there? Good. All right, any more? Any more stock individual picks? While we're in impasse, obviously, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. Appreciate you, appreciate you taking time. You try to say out of your busy schedules to be here. Anything and answered, shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com. Everybody have a great night. And to those of you who are on Facebook, which I think is most of the people here tonight, I'll see you tomorrow. Everybody else, have a great weekend. All right. I think that's it. All right. Uh, again, have a great weekend, and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.